everyone and welcome to this episode of the Connecting Us podcast. My name is Richard and I work in the PMC Connecting Us editorial team. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. In this edition of Connecting Us, we're celebrating diversity and inclusion in the APS and highlighting the unique backgrounds, experiences and perspectives with some of our fellow colleagues. Joining us today is Russ Campbell, Chief Economist and Division Head of Analysis and Insights at the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. Russ, welcome to the podcast and thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's start off with a bit of context. Um, you've had a really rich career uh, spanning three central agencies, two line agencies, and you've even spent time working as a ministerial advisor and uh, private consultant. Yeah. Um, I read online you started off your career as a summer intern back at the Department of Treasury. Um, so I'm curious to hear about your memories from those early days and what keeps drawing you back to the APS? Thanks, Richard. Yeah, look, I, I guess early on in my career, I was wanting to uh, explore what it meant to be working in the public sector. It was something that I developed a real interest in as I was going through my economics degree. And from my perspective, all interesting work seemed to be in Canberra, certainly for an economist. And I went about um, going on the front foot, I guess, with the Department of Treasury to get an internship to sort of test whether my suspicions about the work and what it meant to work in Canberra was, uh, was true or not. And I was very happy to have had that opportunity because it really set me on a path um, subsequently where I've actually looked forward to working across the agencies in Canberra and working with a lot of really talented people um, in what I think is a great city to live in. And and for me, uh, I've always had this motivation within the public service to move to pieces of work, uh, no matter where they are. So I didn't have a particularly strong uh, attachment to either Treasury or Finance or PM&C and more recently uh, Department of Climate Change and uh, currently uh, with uh, Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. Uh, I followed the work, I followed what I thought would be interesting work and I was really encouraged to do that. Um, but all of that motivation was built on a set of strong foundations which I, I, was, I was sort of developed in me quite early on. And I have to say, one of the things I valued most about starting as a graduate in Canberra was the incredible um, camaraderie amongst the graduate cohort. It's really quite a unique experience um, and a lot of enjoyment comes from that. But uh, alongside of that, what was really important was the just amount of time and, and investment that was made in you as a graduate by, at the time, uh, the Department of Finance and then more recently the Treasury. And that, that investment um, really paid off because it, it gave you the opportunity to feel confident to start to contribute really early in your career, much, much earlier than I actually expected. And that was one of the most important takeaways from me early on in my APS career, was just how much responsibility you were given very early on. Uh, what I've noticed though over the years, um, it's easy to think about today's challenges as more complex and more problematic than those in the past. Um, but I think that's a really significant trap. The, the amount of complex and contested policy challenges through the 70s and the 80s and 90s were equally challenging. What I think is different today though is just the sheer pace of the work and also just the increased number of influences that ministers and decision makers face. And so you really need to earn your seat at the table to have that impact and influence. Um, what I took some time out, uh, sort of mid-career, uh, to work with as a ministerial advisor. So I went um, to work for Senator Helen Kernan, one of the Treasury ministers at the time. Uh, and I have to say that was one of the most valuable learning experiences I have ever had. And I would highly recommend a stint in a ministerial office if people have the time and it suits their career choice and, and also their caring responsibilities because it is a, a very large time commitment. But the skills and the confidence that you develop in those roles uh, is invaluable for the rest of your career. 
after after I spent some time as a ministerial advisor, I chose to spend about three, a bit over three years in private consulting. And for me as an economist, and I don't want to pre- present this as, a, as a, an issue for all consulting work, but I just found that the day-to-day uh, influence that you had within the public service was much more satisfying uh, and it was much more regular. And to be frank, just the sheer volume of people that you're working with on a daily basis is generally larger uh, within the public service. And so that, that's largely what drew me back to the public service in the mid-2000s was the opportunity to work on issues where you were influencing ministers on a daily basis. Um, and so they were some of the key motivating factors for me to return. Uh, and I can come to some of those other issues later in our, in our chat if you'd like. But yeah, certainly certainly the early investment, the camaraderie and, and the, the satisfying work was really what drew me to Canberra and the APS. Mm. Um, reflecting back on your time in the minister's office, uh, what are some of those key learnings that you had during that time and you've brought back into your work in the public service? So there's, there's probably two elements to it. One is a personal confidence component. Um, you're often dealing with ministers uh, face-to-face daily, seeing their ups and downs, and you're seeing um, a lot of pressure and learning how to actually communicate very clearly with ministers, but firmly, uh, but also being responsive. Um, and so responsiveness and, and the capacity to take some firm feedback at times, um, it strengthens your own personal confidence when you get put into different roles where you are challenged quite directly like that. Um, so there's definitely a confidence element. I would also say written communications is a skill that markedly improves when you spend some time in a minister's office because you're often dealing with um, multiple requests for question time briefs or speeches, support, uh, or just some talking points for a general set of meetings. And you need to do them incredibly quickly And you need to sharpen the focus down to the key elements of what the minister needs Mm. to be communicating. And whilst you can definitely get that by trying different jobs in the APS more generally, um, it just accelerates it massively by going and spending some time in a minister's Mm. office. And so for those two reasons alone, I think even a very short stint is is a very worthwhile investment in your own career. Mm. Um, in 2016, you commenced as Minister Councillor Economic at the Treasury OECD Paris Post. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that time and how that international experience has shaped and, I guess, enriched your career and perspectives? Yeah. Uh, I mean, firstly, it's a very privileged position, the role of Minister Councillor in the OECD architecture. Um, you're, you're a representative for Australia on a range of committees and, and working groups. And you're, you're needing to be across a very wide range of policy topics and government agendas. And often you're on your own. So you're, you're dealing with issues and making calls um, on behalf of Australia. When Canberra's asleep, it's in the middle, middle of the night, you can't call someone to just check something. So you are flying by the seat of your pants a little bit. Uh, but that also encourages you to focus very clearly on what matters in various briefings and in various products. So it's a, it's a sharpening of your skill set in terms of getting across a wide range of material in a very short period of time. Uh, what's also really valuable from that experience, particularly with an international financial institution like the OECD or indeed the IMF, is the exposure to a lot of counterparts from the member countries that you're dealing with. And so in the OECD case, uh, you've, you've got a, obviously a large number of countries in Europe all with different types of uh, governance and government systems um, which shape how they develop policy and some of the policy issues they're prepared to trial and test um, all the way through to countries like um, Australia and Japan, New Zealand, the United States, sort of probably more part of what we'd call the APEC grouping in, in the OECD where they do have generally have quite different approaches to policy development um, and also general um, support payments and income support and, and incentives within our uh, market economies. Um, they're all very different even within Europe, obviously, but um, there's a lot of lessons that we can take from the experiences of those countries, but also much that we can share as well about what's worked in Australia and what hasn't. We, we do have a quite a proud uh, reform history in Australia that we can share and, ex- and explain to others. Um, 
but there's also an awful lot that we, we should be actually learning from other countries in the OECD about how we can approach, approach new challenges. Um, and collectively, the opportunity to work with and uh, collaborate with other countries on issues that, that you're facing at a similar point in time is really useful. You can connect people in Canberra to counterparts in other member state economies from the OECD membership. You can also uh, speak to some of the OECD staff themselves who actually have a deep, deep expertise and knowledge and can help, help you po get pointed into the right direction to, to draw on those international experiences. And certainly in a lot of the things we're dealing with now in a very interconnected world economy, uh, being able to reach out in real time to a lot of uh, other countries is really important in terms of the policy advice we give to our, to our ministers. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to default to the, the traditional partners, um, and that's useful, the UK and the US and Canada and so forth, but uh, there's a lot to be gained from d diving a bit deeper into a lot of the other countries. So I think that was one of the most valuable things I picked up was just learning how other people do mm. policy and what mm -hmm. are some of the lessons from those. Um, and obviously the opportunity to live for three years abroad in Paris um, is just an extraordinary opportunity just in terms of exposure to a different culture, a different way of working, different way of um, protecting and valuing your leisure time and, and the lunch mm. hour. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite extraordinary. Mm. <laughs> um, we might now turn to explore a bit more of your personal story. Sure. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier on that spending some time in the minister's office really uh, was integral in boosting your personal confidence. And um, yeah, I'll begin to explore that uh, a little bit more and hear uh, what sustains you uh, during the tough times in your role. I don't think there's any easy jobs uh, in the APS. Yeah. And I'm sure your job is no exception. So, yeah, what are your tips for kind of building that personal confidence and uh, being clear on uh, your intent and purpose or even what gets you kind of out of bed in the morning mm. to face those tough days? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I, reflecting on that, um, it, it strikes me there's probably a couple of really important elements to what moved me from being what I would call a fairly insular person to much more confident about putting myself out there. Um, and, I, and I'll come to one element of it in a minute, which is, was a, which is about my, my, my disability and, that, that, and what that meant to me and how I behaved early on in my career versus how I now feel about myself and how I, how I can present myself uh, more, uh, more confidently. But one of the most really important things is actually having a strong senior leader or advocate who will push you and who will push your boundaries. Uh, I was really lucky to have that at multiple stages in my career. Um, the first one, to be honest, was, was the, the minister when I was having moving from being a fairly sort of cautious advisor within the, the APS to having to deal with the sort of day-to-days of a, of a ministerial office that developed within me a real um, confidence to deal with you know the best and the worst in people because you are often in cases where you, you're looking at um, providing uh, an exemption to someone for say the early release of superannuation you are on the phone with people at their wits end they've gone mm -hmm. through the system you're the last port of call you're dealing with people at their most vulnerable and knowing knowing how to handle that and knowing how to deal with situations where you may not have made the right call uh, and learning from that was really important. But the minister was really encouraging, pushed me into a lot of situations and supported me every time. And I really, really appreciated that. Uh, when I returned to the public service, um, also I had a really strong uh, supporter in Martin Parkinson who pushed me into a number of different roles, which for me were quite outside my comfort zone. Um, uh, but he, he made sure that I had enough support and, and backing to do those jobs well. Um, or at least learn to how to, to do them well. And I, I think from my perspective, if you don't have someone looking out for you like that or actually identifying you early on, it doesn't need to be a particularly senior person. It can mm -hmm. be anyone that, that you sort of connect with. Um, just having that support actually does, does help you um, and, and sustain you through those tougher times because you develop a set of skills and coping mechanisms that are really important. Um, also... When I think about the role uh, that I'm currently playing now, just the breadth of experience that I've had, um, whilst it wasn't a very sort of planned career, 
um, definitely not a playing career. That breadth has also allowed me to think more clearly when I'm facing tough challenges in this current role mm. because you've seen so many different environments and different task forces where different approaches have worked or failed and you just feel a little bit more strengthened in your own capacities to draw on uh, a deep, deep experience that you can actually share with others and say, look, we've tried this or we tried that. These were, these were the challenges that we faced. Um, so I think, yeah, having an advocate, pushing yourself outside your comfort zone, developing those coping skills is really important through the tough times. Um, but also the energy and satisfaction you get from working with others. You know, you can turn up to a tough job every day and the content can be tough and mm. challenging. But if you're working with people who are all good spirited, um, working well collegiately, and also uh, certainly as a, a leader within the organisation, you're looking to um, those opportunities to develop someone, to have a breakthrough moment in their own personal development. And seeing that in someone, even under significant pressure, is one of the most satisfying things you can do uh, in a leadership position. And so that that's definitely what helps me get out of bed in the morning when you know you're actually making a contribution to other people as well. Yeah, I think that's such um, tangible advice and totally uh, echo your thoughts about as long as you're working with a fun team, it doesn't matter how hard yeah. or challenging the work is. Absolutely. Um, yeah, makes it fun coming to work every day. Um, Russ, you touched on having uh, your own inclusion journey to share. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about living with a disability and what that has meant for you by serving as a member uh, of the SES? Yeah, sure. Um, so I sustained a permanent spinal injury when I was in my mid-teens. Um, so it was before I'd gone to finish my schooling, before I'd gone to university. So in a, in a perverse way, it was in terms of timing, I hadn't had an established career that I hadly had suddenly had a jarring change to. So at one level, it was the right time for me to have had a significant situation like that happen. Now, of course, you don't want that personally to happen to yourself. And you go through quite a deep, dark place for a little while as you adjust to that. But then with the right sort of family networks, friend networks, and then ultimately work networks, you, you realise that there are a lot of things that you can do and you, you start to focus on those. Mm-hmm. Um, but even in the, in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, where, where, I, where I first was injured, um, it was still, disability was still, particularly in a visual disability like my own, which is as a, a confined to a wheelchair, that, that visibility was always something that was, you were conscious of and you were noticed in the streets and things like that started to affect how you personally dealt with um, interactions and your own confidence about your value as, a, as a, a potential employee. And so I think in my early early stages in my career, I was very cautious, was not wanting to seem too different or not feel like I'm putting people out. Um, you, I look back on those days now and thought, wish, I wish I had a, a role model that I could have spoken to about, you know, what things to worry about in the workplace, what things not to worry about in the workplace so that you weren't almost constraining your own ambition and constraining your own behaviours in a way which wasn't really revealing the real you. Um, So that for me has been quite a journey. And as I say, uh, when I first left the public service um, at the EL2 level, I'd obviously got to a level to be a manager where I was sufficiently confident to to lead a small team of people. But at the end of the day, I was still very cautious as, as as in a personal capacity. Um, and so that for me, that journey, I'm now very confident in my, in my own skin. Um, I think having worked at the OECD role uh, and a number of SES positions where you're doing a lot of public speaking and presenting, putting yourself out there means that all of those initial concerns about you know, how you view yourself and how others might view you sort of start to sort of ebb away. And, and I like to try and... Um, reflect those experiences to people who are in a similar situation to myself because I, I think as I say that the opportunity to see a role model in a job in a senior position would have been so valuable to me as I was starting mm-hmm. out my career mm-hmm. um, and I know certainly I've had that feedback I've done a number of uh, lectures to potential graduate groups uh, in at ANU at the University of Canberra and, and for people in wheelchairs or with disabilities and, and seeing someone who's actually gone through the system and, and done well and reached the, the SES and had an opportunity to sort of 
speak about the good and the bad of the whole journey um, has been really well received. Um, so I would encourage senior leaders, regardless of what issue that they're confronting, what personal history they have, whether it's a physical disability, whether it's a mental health issue, an anxiety issue, whatever issue it is, be generous with your time mm. and share that experience with others because it's so important mm. for, for people starting out in their career to see that. Um, I think the other thing that uh, I take away from the experiences that I've had uh, in being in a wheelchair is just how lucky we are in Australia to have a very open embracing culture of difference and disability. Um, my time when I was spending in, in large parts of Europe and France as well, it's just I was struck by how few people were out and about in wheelchairs. It was extraordinary. The, the, the percentage of disability in the community is pretty much exactly the same, but people are just not out and about. Mm. And I, I reflected on what was driving that. There, there are definitely cultural differences about difference and disability. Um, and, and sometimes it's a patronising disposition. Sometimes it's, you know, why are you out here? Like, it can be quite confronting at times in different cultures. Um, but I think one of the things that was really important, certainly in the United States and Australia, is that we were very, very early adopters of rights around um, access to just the built environment and to transport systems. Now, there's obviously still quite a long way to go in many of those things, but Australia is so far advanced compared to other countries. Um, so that, that's a positive that I took mm. away from my experience overseas is that, you know, we're doing a lot better. Um, we obviously can do more, but by golly, we're, we're a long way ahead. Mm. Um, picking up on the theme of the importance of role models in the workplace, um, what does leadership mean to you and how can people demonstrate leadership in the inclusion space? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. I mean, probably boils down to a few few factors i mean as i was just saying before i think for me um having role models is a really key element of leading so if you're wanting to um encourage and provide support to staff who may have a disability in your division or in your uh, in your working group um helping them to find role models or mentors that can give them that external confidence that's not part of the direct line of management responsibility so that people can ask the, the mm. tricky question or the awkward question that they don't feel they can in a formal working arrangement. Um, so the role model thing is really important, um, identifying mentors. Uh, I also think, um, and it's incumbent upon organisations and their HR systems and their disability panels to try and find really simple explanations or um, what's the right word for it? it's probably a case of case studies or examples of interactions that are healthy mm -hmm. and that give people confidence to ask the right questions about is someone sufficiently supported in the work in workplace or in the environment um, because I know um, people are scared to ask certain questions they feel like they're invading someone's personal space or treading on someone's toes or in a way that is possibly too personal but and and there will definitely be people that will have views about where that boundary line sits mm -hmm. but I, I think for the vast majority of people with, with a disability they're, they're quite comfortable to have those conversations and would welcome it because it allows people to break down unconscious barriers and, and biases about someone's capacity to do certain things and so that's the related element of it in a leadership role is to not assume away someone's opportunities and, and capacities. Um, treat them as though they were any other uh, officer that might need a bit of extra support. Um, and then if that person says, actually, no, that's probably just a bit, bit of a bridge too far for me, then that's fine. You've had the conversation, but at least they've had the opportunity to say yes to something. Um, and I think that's really important for um, both the manager, uh, if who may not have a disability, but with someone in their team that does, um, being able to have a healthy, um, clear and vibrant conversation around those issues is really important. So I would encourage any organisation to really push that through their HR and disability panel networks to ensure that there's a, a safe set of words or even, even a, an advisor that they can talk to about, look, I've got this issue, I don't quite know how to raise it with the, with the individual involved, what's the best way of approaching this subject? Mm. Um, Russ, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us uh, about your professional 
and personal journey. Uh, one final question uh, before we wrap up. Um, do you have any advice for people from a diverse background uh, who are thinking about a career within your department uh, or the APS more broadly, or maybe even for someone who's in the APS thinking about making the jump to their CS? First thing is be bold and brave and push yourself. Um, doesn't matter which organisation we're talking about, whether it's whether it's DISA or whether it's uh, another organisation, the APS, is don't don't self select yourself out of opportunities because you don't think you can do it. Um, as I said earlier in my career, I did that a lot. Uh, it wasn't actually till quite late in my career I was competent enough to apply for an international position within Treasury or. Uh, go on particular um, presentation um, trips around the country to, to present in various forums. You, you need to push yourself, but you also need to know that there's going to be a receptive environment on the other side. And, and certainly um, my, my experience today in DISA and with our Disability Action Plan, and also um, the Secretary Frederick's um, many statements that he's made on this over time, is that we do actually want the best DISA to be the best possible place to work. Um, we want to make sure we've got the strong supports and, and encouragement there. But we also want to ensure we've got a diverse and, and non-judgmental culture as well. Um, we've, we've got a really healthy set of um, uh, networks within the, within the department around different types of difference and disability or uh, cultural differences. Um, and and, and those, those panels and, and sessions where are really well attended within DISA. So there, there's actually a very positive culture that, that sits underneath a lot of what we do here. Um, and I know more broadly for the APS, um, uh, David Fredericks, who's the, the champion of the disability uh, network, um, that there will be a, an APS-wide disability um, uh, uh, employment strategy launched for mm. the period 2020 to 25. Mm. I think that's coming up in early December. Mm. Uh, mm. And I'll, I'll definitely be keenly uh, looking forward to seeing that because I know um, we got to a, a certain point um, and there are still issues around people being comfortable dis even disclosing whether they have a disability and, and there's obviously some still barriers that we need to, to work through there but um, I think for DISA and for the APS more broadly we've got a lot of really good frameworks in place as I said before there's a lot uh, that Australia can celebrate how far we've come uh, so we're building a really strong foundation so I'd say go for it and if you have any doubts, talk to people and any role models or mentors you can to get a good sense of whether a department has the right culture for you. Thanks, Russ. Um, I think that advice and insights you've shared uh, will be incredibly valuable for our listeners. And I know for me personally as well, particularly hearing right. about um, that personal confidence and being brave and bold, I think um, yeah. relevant to everyone. So that's all we've got time for today. Thanks to Russ Campbell from the Department of uh, Industry, Science, Energy and Resources for sharing his time with us uh, this afternoon. And thanks everyone for listening. Don't forget to check out our latest edition of Connecting Us for more stories from your APS colleagues about inclusion and diversity. Today's show was written and presented by Richard Ziokowski with editorial input from Indrani Sen. Matthew Bully did the sound editing, original music by Ed Reading. Special thanks to Russ Campbell, Chief Economist and Division Head of Analysis and Insights at the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources for sharing his story with us. Thanks for listening. We look forward to sharing more APS stories like this one with you through Connecting Us.